All right, I think we're live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the SFU Trache Observatory Starry Night Stream. My right. name is Matthew I Simone, and I'm one of the staff members. Good evening, at everyone, here. and welcome to the SFU Trache Observatory oh, Starry my... Night Stream. And I've got my own audio up in my own feed here, so that's no good. And uh, great, so we've got sound. At least we know we have sound. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, we've got a list of cool objects uh, that we're going to be going through tonight. What we're going to be doing is basically traveling in uh, ascending order of distance from the Earth. One of the things that I get asked often when we're looking at objects in the night sky and through the telescope is how far things are away. Like, how far is this away from us? And I think that's actually a really pertinent question because uh, when you think about it, people want to know, like, I want to put this in perspective to where I am and where I'm living, like here on the Earth. Uh, but not only that, when, remember, when we're looking back into space, we're also looking back through time. And in some ways, that is like us exploring the memory of the universe. Light itself is kind of like digging into the universe's memory. Uh, it's a way of doing archaeology, but in, in, in light, which is pretty awesome. Because as we look back into objects that are farther back in the past, uh, we're actually looking back in time. So as we're traveling throughout the course of the show today, we're actually going to be moving into the past and being able to see objects that are helping us understand the history of our own universe. But to get started, we're going to become, uh, going to start somewhere closer to Earth, and we're going to be looking at somewhere where humans have, have boldly gone before already, and that is the moon. So if I've done this right, then the moon should appear with some slight tweaks of the telescope. And here we are. Here we are, looking at our own moon. Hooray! And I picked a section of the moon here. This uh, crater is uh, its one that's uh, clearly visible. This is called Plato Crater. And uh, a crater like this, about that size, just to give you in perspective on the moon's surface, is about 100 kilometers across. Uh, so it gives you an idea of like how big the moon actually is. I think when we see the moon up in the sky and we think, well, it's smaller than us, it orbits us, uh, how big can it actually be? So here's one very tiny feature on the moon, and it is actually 100 kilometers wide. Um, and probably in the past it would have been flowing lava at some point as well, uh, because it would have been impacted, and impacts like that ultimately create uh, a liquefied surface on the moon because it's so hot and uh, we could actually start dating craters on the moon now uh, there's some amazing research that's being done by uh, a woman canadian uh, iranian canadian woman named sarah mazuri and she's been doing research in canada um, on dating the age of craters and the way that we do that is by looking at the reflectivity on the edges of the crater so the more reflective that the edge of the crater is probably the newer the crater is because the edges are still very sharp and as they get weathered away by solar radiation, by impacts with other craters, um, those edges start becoming less reflective and we're able to date how old the crater on the moon really is. And the reason why this is important to us is it gives us an idea of our own history of our the formation of our solar system. We know that there are periods of time where there's a lot more just like loose junk floating around in the solar system and that would start to crash into places like the moon. And then we can get an idea of when those uh, those those moments of activity, heavy activity, happened uh, within our own solar system, which is pretty awesome. Uh, another spot in the moon we're going to go to, since we visited the moon, let's go find where we landed the first time. So hopefully I've got my moon geography right here. Let's head over in this direction. Uh, a little bit too far. Hang on. All right. So here is the uh, Sea of Tranquility, and Apollo Eleven. If I'm right, we landed right about here, more or less, and that was our first touchdown on the moon. And one of the reasons why we wanted to go to the moon was to learn a little bit more about where it came from. Our moon is actually kind of weird because there are other moons in the solar system that are as large as our moon, but they are orbiting planets like gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn that are way larger than us. So how is it that we ended up with a moon that's as big as our moon? And one of the things we discovered by taking samples of the moon's surface, uh, we call it the regolith, is it turns out the moon and the Earth are actually chemically very similar. Uh, in fact, so similar that we're pretty sure the moon is actually a big chunk of Earth that got knocked off into space uh, about 4 billion years ago. So uh, we call it the big splat theory. 
In order to simulate in our computers an impact that would generate the moon from our own planet, we figure that something crashed into us about the size of Mars. Uh, we call that planet, that theoretical planet, Theia. Uh, remember, the early solar system wasn't the orderly place with the eight planets uh, that we have now. It was all the stuff that was kind of settling into place. We had planetesimals that were forming into planets. Things sometimes got into the same lane in their orbits around the sun, and eventually you have a collision. And so the early Earth was actually impacted by one of these planets, and the resulting debris that was sprayed off of the Earth coalesced together and formed our own moon. And we don't know quite yet because we only have... Uh, a sample size of one in terms of planets that harbor life, but it might be possible that the moon's presence in orbit around our Earth uh, helped to shape in the evolution of life on our own planet. We think that it helps to stabilize the axial tilt of our planet. Maybe that helps us to have climate that's steadier for longer periods of time. Uh, so that's kind of neat. Uh, and if there's one thing, I, there's no direct evidence, mind you, that aliens have ever visited our planet before, but if there was one tourist destination in the galaxy, it might be for aliens to come here to see our own moon because it creates eclipses. And there's this weird freak of nature about our own moon is that it happens to be almost the same size visibly as the sun in the sky and just covers our sun perfectly enough so that we're able to see the corona of the sun. I don't know if you've ever seen a solar eclipse before, but it's one of the most amazing things you could ever see. Uh, there's one going to be happening toward the East Coast on, I think, in 2024. So if you get a chance to go do that, please do, because it might be one of the most unique phenomena. If there's one unique thing about our planet, it might be our relationship with our moon and the fact that it happens to be that right distance from us and right size, that it makes that perfect covering of the sun to create a total solar eclipse. All right, moving on. So we're going to leave the moon now, and we're going to start heading out into our solar system to visit some planets. So we're going to go to Jupiter. All right, here we go. Planet Jupiter. So the moon is only about 300 and 80,000 kilometers away from Earth. We can get there in about three days by spaceship. Um, that's if, you've, if you have humans on your spaceship, it takes you about that long to get there. I'm gonna turn up the exposure a little bit so we can see Jupiter a wee bit more clearly. Some of the moons as well, maybe not too much, we don't lose the bands. Um, you can get there a lot faster you're traveling through the solar system if you don't have meaty people inside of your spaceship. We have to launch them a little bit more slowly so we don't crush them. Uh, so when we launched Voyager, for example, which reached the edge of our solar system in 2015, uh, it was able to get to the moon in like less than a day and uh, pass by it, whereas Apollo took a couple more days because uh, big, bigger, heavier rockets filled with more stuff. So by contrast, Jupiter is 660 million kilometers away from Earth. So to get there by spacecraft would take you a couple years. Uh, if you were going by, say, normal car speed, if you could theoretically drive across the solar system in a vehicle to get to Jupiter, it would take you about a thousand years. Uh, no bathroom breaks, uh, so you, need, you have to hold your breath the entire way. It would probably be the worst road trip ever. But here we are, we're looking at Jupiter, largest planet in our solar system. Uh, you can fit all the other planets in our solar system inside of Jupiter and still have room to spare. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more here. Oh. There we go. Oh, that might be a little bit too much. Okay, 125. 25, there we go. You can see the, the bands and stripes here. Uh, the bands and stripes on Jupiter are actually uh, disturbances in Jupiter's atmosphere. So these are like wind currents that are ripping around Jupiter. And Jupiter is basically just a giant cloud floating in space. It is primarily made of hydrogen gas, uh, trace amounts of helium. Now, we're not entirely sure how gas giants like Jupiter form in our solar system. Uh, there's two competing theories. One is that uh, it simply forms from eddies of gas uh, that were flowing around our early sun as it was forming that just collected together using gravity. Um, another possibility is that it starts with a rocky core. So like Earth did, uh, it's an assemblage of rock that accreted together that forms a nucleus around which the heavier, or which the gases then form around. Uh, it's just that it kind of have a runaway atmosphere effect. So it creates this giant, giant atmosphere uh, that ends up creating Jupiter. Now, there is some debate now as to whether or not uh, Jupiter's 
has a current impact on the solar system because of its gravity. Uh, Jupiter has, was once thought to act kind of like a bodyguard for our solar system because it's so heavy and its gravity is so strong, there's the possibility that it actually draws comets or asteroids toward it rather than them traveling farther out or farther into the interior of the solar system where they might hit planets like ours. And if it's bad for your planet to be hit by a comet, just ask a dinosaur and they will tell you because likely that's what happened to them. So, um, but now there's some competing research that says that Jupiter may not have that effect. In fact, Jupiter in the solar system might have had the, the, the effect of throwing more objects into the interior of the solar system. So we're not quite sure yet. But uh, in the future, when we understand those kind of dynamics in our solar system better, these kinds of things help to inform us as to what kind of solar systems and configurations of solar systems to be looking for for habitability. So maybe in the future we want to know, um, you know, whether or not there is a large gas giant in a solar system that's acting as a comet catcher uh, to to protect us. And Dr. Wu says here, it depends on where the Earth and Jupiter are in their orbits. Okay, so that could be part of it as well. And we know that where the planets are in their orbits have also changed over time. So it's possible that Jupiter's effect in the solar system changes depending on where it is in the solar system. But we have actually witnessed comets traveling toward Jupiter. Uh, in the mid-1990s, there was one called Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. And as it was approaching Jupiter, it was actually ripped apart by Jupiter's gravity and all the individual comet fragments uh, crashed into Jupiter and we were able to see the explosions that kind of these markings uh, on Jupiter which was which was really cool um, these lights here around Jupiter are not stars they are actually uh, the moons of Jupiter we call them the Galilean moons so-called because they were seen by Galileo through his telescope uh, since then of course we now know that Jupiter has far more than uh, the four moons uh, the Galilean moons we can see here's one two three and I don't know if we can't see the fourth right now because of this view or because one of them is behind the planet presently. Oh, I think that's it over there. So there you go. One, two, three, four. And uh, one of those moons we are very interested in uh, because it is called Europa. And Europa, we're pretty sure, actually has twice as much water as Earth has. You know, we think of Earth as being the one watery place in the solar system, but that's not true. Uh, so Europa on the surface is covered in ice. But we see that that icy surface shifts and moves and changes, and we think that's because there's a lot of subsurface uh, oceanic activity happening uh, underneath. So we want to go in there and figure out if there's something living there, because it's possible that with all that water, and we know the water has similar chemistry to the oceans on Earth, uh, that maybe that, that they have given rise to life on another world. So right now we are planning a mission to Mars. Uh, called the or to uh, to Europa called the the uh, Europa Clipper and it is going to be surveying the surface of Europa for a landing site in the future to land an aquanaut so a robotic submarine on Europa that will tunnel down into the ice uh, which could be up to 10 kilometers thick in some places and see if there's anything living down there maybe we'll find space fish or space whales or space octopi who knows uh, but that would be pretty amazing because uh, whereas we are looking for life on Mars as well, and I'll get into that later because we're hoping to see Mars later on this evening, um, there's not a guarantee yet that if we find life on Mars, that means that life has happened elsewhere in the solar system. And the reason for that is because Mars and Earth exchange a lot of material in orbits with one another, so it's possible that we've shared life between one another, that either Mars seeded life on Earth, so we're actually technically all Martians, or that Earth seeded life on on Mars. So if we find some there, then it's possible that that actually came from Earth. But if we find life on Europa, Europa is so far away, it is isolated from our own planet. So we know then that if we were to find life on a moon around one of these gas giants, that it is in fact indeed a second genesis of life. And then if you, the way that you count uh, to uh, life in the universe is one, two, and then infinity. Because if you have two examples of it just within our own solar system, likely it is probably elsewhere in the universe as well, which is pretty cool. All right, so let's move on from Jupiter. And the next one we're going to see, which is my favorite, Saturn. And one of, if any of the, the, uh, uh, the senior rascals are in in the stream. Uh, one of the things they always make fun of us young whippersnappers for is not having the night sky memorized. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why. Because we are 
uh, so spoiled by the fact that I can literally just go into the computer, click a button, and move the entire telescope. So uh, it's like people driving around now with GPS all the time. You never memorize streets. So this is this is something I need to do is memorize the night sky better and not rely on the computer so much. Okay, here we go. Oh, amazing. I have very keen memories of the first time I saw Saturn through a telescope, and I'm pretty sure that's one of the reasons why I'm here doing this stream with you now. All right, let's bring it up a little bit. There we go. Maybe we can get a little bit more zoom here. All right, here we go. Planet Saturn. Um, now, that wobbliness, if you look at it right now, it's kind of wobbling around. This is distortion from the atmosphere. So there's a lot of, of air that's always moving around in our, in our Earth. And of course, we need that because we have to breathe. But the disadvantage of it is that it bends light as it's approaching Earth. And so as that light is moving through a turbulent atmosphere, it makes planets look like they're wobbling all over the place. Now, we don't notice this effect as much when we're imaging very large objects like nebula or galaxies. But when you point the telescope at a very tiny, tiny pinpoint of light, that is created by a planet or a star, you really start to notice these effects more. Uh, so one of the ways that we, how do you take a picture of this then? Because you've obviously you've seen pictures of planets that are a lot sharper than we're getting here. Well, the way we do that is something called lucky imaging. So what we'll do is we'll start our camera rolling. And if you look at a video camera, a video camera is really just individual frames of pictures being taken uh, throughout the course of a second. You have 24 of them. It makes 24 frames in a second. So what we'll do is we'll videotape a planet and then you pick out the frames where the planet just happens to be in focus. That one moment where it wasn't being distorted by the atmosphere, that lucky picture. That's why it's called lucky imaging. And then you can pull out a few of those pictures and you layer them all together and you'll get one really nice in focus picture of a planet. So if you've ever seen a, fi a picture of a planet being taken from Earth, it's never just one photo. It's actually layered images of, of these lucky snapshots from video that are being taken. Because otherwise, if you're looking at a planet live, it's always gonna look like this to us because of the distortion of light. Uh, now, Saturn's main feature, of course, is its rings. We think the rings of Saturn might actually be pretty new, uh, maybe on the order of only a few hundred million years. And that, of course, doesn't sound new to us because the timescales of humanity are much shorter. But remember, Saturn is 4,500 million years old. So those rings have only been around for a little while. In fact, if you were to look up at Saturn, maybe in the era of the dinosaurs, Saturn might have not had rings. Uh, so that's kind of amazing when you think about it. So what are the rings? Well, if you add up all the material that's floating around Saturn and were to pack it back together into a ball, it's quite likely that the rings of Saturn are formerly one of Saturn's moons. And two competing theories as to how that, uh, that moon was shattered apart is one, the moon got too close to Saturn and it approached something called the Roche limit. And that limit is how close two bodies can be in proximity to each other before the larger one with its greater gravity rips the smaller one to pieces and then all those pieces would be scattered out into the orbit of Saturn. So in essence, you can think of the rings of Saturn as kind of like millions of mini moons that are all orbiting around the outside. And the cool thing about them is that they tend to jostle into each other and bounce around with one another a lot. And so they, they essentially polish each other off. They're also made of a lot of ice water. And so as a result, the rings of Saturn are very bright because they're always kind of polishing the surface instead of accumulating dust. That dust often gets knocked off because of the, the collision with one another. And a lot of the particles are, are pretty tiny. Like, um, you know, not a lot of them are much bigger than, say, the size of a house. So certainly a lot smaller than a moon. And they're also not very thick. Uh, there's also a number of moons that orbit within the rings of Saturn. They're called shepherd moons, and they actually help to shape and change uh, the rings. And there are some really cool pictures from the Cassini space probe, uh, which was orbiting Saturn for over a decade and took a lot of pictures. And you can see ripples in the rings that are created by the gravity of these passing moons that are traveling through the rings, which is pretty amazing. Uh, one of the moons of Saturn is the only one in the solar system with an appreciable atmosphere, and it's called Titan. Uh, we landed a probe on it called the Huygens probe, and it is the most distant probe that humans have ever landed on the surface of another world. So orbiting Saturn on Titan is a probe that we've landed, and it's the furthest thing we've ever landed on another planet or another planetary body and taken a picture of, which is pretty cool. All right. Saturn's 1.4 billion kilometers. We are now going to leave the solar system entirely, and we're going to look at something called 
the the ring nebula. And before I do that, I'm gonna have to change some settings here. So one sec. I guess it's still pretty bright out there, isn't it? Now I'm looking at the cameras outside. Hopefully it's dark enough that we can get some of these darker objects. Let's see. Oh yeah, there it is. All right, cool. All right, let's zoom back a little bit here. Okay, as we're gonna see, it's starting to appear before our eyes. So um, we kind of talk about the photography process a little bit here in the, in the observatory. I'll just kind of go over it again. So what we're doing is something called live stacking. So when you take a picture of something with your camera, your camera takes it in like, you know, a fraction of a second. So maybe a hundredth of a second or even a thousandth of a second. When we're taking images from space, we have to take more light into our cameras to be able to see the object that we're looking at. Uh, the best way to think of it is kind of like a bucket that's outside in the rain. So when you leave your bucket out in the rain, the longer you leave it outside, the more rain it's going to collect, the more it's going to fill up. So instead of rain, think about those droplets as photons. So individual particles of light that are filling up your camera. And the longer we leave the exposure on, the more we get those little droplets of light that are streaming inside to our camera. And they fill up on our sensor that's turning them into electronic signal and then creates a picture out of them, which is pretty cool. And uh, as Dr. Wu is pointing out, the halo on the bottom right corner is from these new lamps that have been set up on campus, creating light pollution. So this is one of the reasons why, you know, if you're if you have people that your life that are astronomers and when they complain about lights out of the streets or lights that have, have been set up by neighbors, this is one of the reasons why. So there's these new lights that have been put on a trailer outside of the observatory and we're getting some halo from it. So this is not a nebula, although it does kind of look like one. So what I'll do is uh, maybe I can, if I zoom in a wee bit here, we might be able to sort of cut it out of the picture so we don't see it quite as much. I don't want to zoom in too much though because our nebula is going to start looking a wee fuzzy. Ah. All right, let's change some of our settings here. Okay, so yeah, we're talking about light streaming from dif distant sources. Now remember, light coming from these faint objects is so far away that it's very scarce. And so that's why we have to leave our exposures on for so long. So what we're doing is every single one of these pictures is 20 seconds, and then we're layering each one of them on top of the other one. So right now we've got eight pictures of 20 seconds layered on, and it's helping to create a more clear picture. And if I play around with some of the settings, we should be able to get it even a wee bit clearer here. Let's see what we got. Change some of the colors here. There we go. A bit clearer. Oh, 
All right, in the meantime, while this is stacking, we'll talk a little bit about rings. So the ring nebula, we've, I, like the last thing we were looking at was Saturn, which was 1.4 billion kilometers away from Earth. Well, the ring nebula is now 2,500 light years away from Earth. So when light left this object, it left 2,500 years ago, right? And before we had internet. So think about that. The internet was not even around yet. This light was streaming through space and it happened to arrive on our planet in time for us to catch it in an electronic camera, stream it to my house, and then from my house to all of you. And that's pretty cool, right? Think about that. 2,500 years ago, these particles of light left. And the neat thing about them is that each photon of light is unique. So when they're traveling through space, each one of them has taken a unique journey through space and landed in our specific telescope to make this picture. So, I don't know, I find that's kind of a neat way to connect with the universe, to think that we're, we're looking at unique pieces of light that left this object 2,500 years ago uh, to come here. The Ring Nebula is called Messier 57, and it was part of the catalog that was created by Charles Messier. And Charles Messier was a French astronomer, and his he... He lived an interesting life. He was basically what he was trying to do was find comets. That was his plan. He was like, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find a bunch of comets. And he was kind of annoyed by the fact that he kept going out every night and he found things that weren't comets. And then he would mark them down in his catalog. So this was number 57 of something that was not a comet. And then he would move on to something else. Uh, his life, his early life was inspired by seeing a very brilliant comet. Uh, and he wanted to go out and find more of them. And so he wanted to go and find these comets. And he was also inspired by a solar eclipse that he saw. So he made it his mission to go telescope, uh, to go comet hunting, kind of like we were all doing last month uh, when Neowise was at our skies. And so it, it was amazing, though, that it is life of not discovering comets. He discovered all these other amazing objects that we get to look at now, which is pretty amazing. Uh, so, yeah, the Ring Nebula uh, was discovered in uh, 1800 to have a faint central star. I think some of you are talking about that in the chat right now. And that's it right there. And that central star is actually a white dwarf. So, the Ring Nebula is a dead star. This is a star that has died. It's shed its outer layers off into space. And uh, it's not massive enough. Big stars, when they're massive enough, they will die in a supernova explosion. But this star is probably closer in mass to our own sun, which will die as one of these things, a planetary nebula. So its outer layers are shed off. You can see some of the colors here, kind of more green on the inside and redder on the outside. And those colors indicate the composition of those gases. So the greener gases over here are probably more like oxygen. The outside red ones are layers of hydrogen that have been shed off from the star and heading out into space. Um, and there was a, another astronomer named Will William Huggins who discovered that the, the colors of the gas were very similar to how fluorescent gases glowed on our own planet. And he was the one to determine that the planetary nebula was in fact not a planet, as we sometimes thought it was. Um, there was other astronomers that looked at it and said that it, it looks as large as Jupiter and it resembles a planet that's fading because at that time we didn't know how far away these objects actually were. We thought maybe there were other planets that we were looking at uh, in maybe in our own solar system until we realized how distant they are. Um, a nebula like this might be, say, maybe half to a quarter light year across. So not super big, and uh, that'll be a, com a good comparison for later on. We're going to look at nebula that are much larger than this one. The central massive, or the central uh, white dwarf, is also about the size of the Earth. So it's about planetary in size. Um, and it's made out of the heaviest elements that the star had created before it died. And in this case, usually it's carbon. Um, so we're basically looking at a big ball of compressed carbon that's giving off gas into space. And if you know your chemistry, you know that compressed carbon becomes a diamond. So white dwarf stars like this one that's at the center of the ring nebula is basically a giant floating diamond in space. I'm pretty sure this might be apocryphal now, but one of the largest ones we've seen we've named uh, Lucy after the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. All right, there you go. Let's see if I can get it a little bit clearer. I think we're still just getting some sky glow, which is why I'm not getting this quite as colorful as I hoped. Cool. All right. Well, maybe we'll come back to that one if it gets a little bit darker. Uh, we were looking at one last night, which was super cool, and that is the Cat's Eye Nebula. So we're going to go to that one next. Here we go. Roundabout to the other side of the sky. And if you watch the videos that we've got, you can actually see the telescope moving and the dome turning as we're heading out to these different objects. So 
We'll clear our picture, let's start another stack. First one's probably a bit blurry because the telescope's still moving, so I'm going to start over. And hopefully in this direction that we're looking, we won't see that glare from the light that from the beside the telescope. Ah, look at that. See if we can get it a little bit clearer. There we go. Good question. How much is the telescope that you guys are running? Um, I think the scope itself, when it was first delivered, the whole, um, the entire observatory itself was a gift from the Trache Family Foundation, uh, and its goals are for science outreach. That's why the observatory is built beside a city with giant glowy lights and not out all the way out into the mountains because we wanted it to be in a place that's still accessible for the community. And so that's why we're doing what we're doing tonight even. Uh, even when we can't go out there, at least we could all still connect virtually. Uh, the point was to be able to give people a chance to connect with the stars, make them closer to Earth. And so with their generous gift, I think the entire um, uh, setup was around $3.5 million. The telescope itself was about 250000 And when we got it delivered... There wasn't yet the dome on top to put it, so they had to put it in storage somewhere, and I just told them to keep it at my house, but they laughed at me and said no. All right, so here we are with the Cat's Eye Nebula. Um, you can kind of see these filaments that come streaming out from the nebula itself. Let's see if I can sharpen them a little bit. Now, in a contrast to the Ring Nebula, the Cat's Eye Nebula is not actually a dead star, but it might be in the process of dying. So it's a star that's kind of giving off these big bursts of material. And the center star in the middle, uh, we can't see it super well because it's sort of obscured by all the spinning cloud of material. But we think it's something called a wolf rayet star. Uh, wolf rayet stars are kind of unstable. They have these like, uh, they think of them like when you look at our sun, you can see that it's a clear spherical surface. And that surface is called the photosphere, and it's very distinct from the rest of the corona or the atmosphere of the rest of the star. Um, wolf rayet stars, they kind of like, they're just one big massive starry cloud. They're billowing off material. They're highly unstable. They kind of go through these cycles where they almost have fake supernova, and they're blowing pieces of themselves off into space. And so that's what this cloud of material is. It's actually a cloud around a violent maelstrom star that's kind of blowing itself to pieces from time to time. Uh, a star like this might eventually go supernova. Uh, it hasn't yet, but they kind of go through these periods where they look like they almost have gone supernova, but have just been sending out like a whole bunch of material off into space. Um, Stellar winds off of this star have been clocked at 1,900 kilometers per second. So these winds, these clouds of material that are blowing off of this star, yeah, they're traveling through space that quickly, 1,900 kilometers per second. So these nebula are close enough to us, whether they are supernova uh, or planetary nebula, they're close enough to us that we can actually see changes in them. They're moving quickly enough that over time, I've seen a few time lapses done of these nebula where you can see changes in them uh, over time, which is really cool. That's in human lifetime. Normally, we don't think of the sky changing that frequently within human lifetime, but we actually can do that. We can see these changes happen. All right, let's see if I can get this even a little bit clearer here. Yeah, I think I'm still fighting with a wee bit of sky glow.
I also noticed that there's the odd cloud out there today, so hopefully none of them pass in front of our field of view. All right. Okay, so two planetary nebula, one with a dead white dwarf star at the center, the ring nebula, and one with a star that's probably on the verge of dying, billowing off giant pieces of itself out into space. So I'm going to move on now. So we're at a distance. We started off at the moon at 380,000 kilometers, went to Jupiter at 660 million, Saturn at 1.4 billion, the ring nebula at 2,500. This is the cat's eye at 3,000. And now we're going to be moving off to 5,000, and that is going to be the Swan Nebula, which is also sometimes called the Omega Nebula. So that's where we're going to next. Some question, where can you get high resolution nebula images like from Hubble? Um, Actually, you can get them online. Basically, like if you go into the Hubble website, there's a whole catalog of photos you can find on there. And a lot of the times, if you are looking up or researching these images online yourself, uh, like if you find them on Wikipedia or whatever, usually the default image that's set to them often is from Hubble because Hubble's got the advantage that it is floating above the Earth's atmosphere, so it doesn't have to fight with the atmosphere like we do. All right, here we go, back to the other side of the sky. Now, something I want to point out, uh, Swan Nebula and, and also uh, the Eagle Nebula, which we'll be looking at probably later too, they, these are star-forming regions, and there's a reason why we find them in this part of the sky. If you look here, so I'll zoom in here, this is our computer view of the night sky, and this part here is looking toward the south, and this is the core of the Milky Way galaxy. And along the spiral arms of the galaxy, and remember we're looking kind of like into the toward the center of the galaxy we're also looking through those spiral arms well that's where star formation happens the spiral arms have all the raw material to make new stars and to make new planets if you look at our galaxy from the top down it's a big spiraling disk and we're about two-thirds of the way out from the center so we live like in the burnaby of the milky way galaxy we're sort of out in the suburbs and uh for the center part of the galaxy if we're to go past these nebula all the way to the center um, we're not sure if life can actually happen in the center of our galaxy. It's kind of a maelstrom place. There's like the supermassive black hole. There's a lot of really old stars or supernova going on. And so as we know that there's sort of a habitable zone around planets, and the habitable zone of a planet is defined by it being in a place around its star where it can have liquid water on the surface, like our planet. We sometimes call it the Goldilocks zone where it's not too hot or not too cold, but just right. Well, we think maybe within the disk of a galaxy, there might be a habitable zone as well. It might have to be out toward the edges or away from the core where our sun orbits. And our sun actually orbits the galaxy fairly circular as well. There are some stars that kind of take a dip through the center of the galaxy, but ours doesn't. So we orbit the galaxy about once every 250 million years. So to put that in perspective, dinosaurs lived on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy. Something to think about. Right? But because we're looking through the spiral arms, we're going to find these star-forming regions like the Swan Nebula. And, well, let's take a look at it. We have to clear our image and start over. There we go. And I might have to change my stacking for this one, so give me one second here. Okay, we've changed our settings now that we are imaging 
uh, larger, more diffuse nebula. So the reason why we're changing the settings is because everything else we've been imaging up to this point has been pretty bright individual points of light. But these nebula are very bright uh, or very diffuse in terms of like their brightness over a wider area. Yeah, someone's asking about Andromeda. Uh, we might be looking at one of the companions to Andromeda later on tonight. I was thinking about checking out a couple galaxies. We'll see how much time we've got. Andromeda is pretty neat because it's the largest object that a human being can see with the naked eye, which is pretty cool. I wonder if maybe I'm in a cloud. Yeah, it looks like that because I'm not seeing anything. This amazing cloud. We were wanted to look at a cloud, but not this one. Not a cloud this close to Earth. Okay, so it looks like we're looking at a cloud in that direction. Let's see if I can switch to something else. This is why we have backup objects. So I'm going to pick a different nebula, although they tend to be in this kind of direction. So let's see what happens. Hopefully I can get around this cloud. All right, so I was saying earlier, that's why these star forming regions are kind of in this direction toward um, all the busyness of the galaxy, because we're looking in the spiral arms that have all the material. So although the Eagle Nebula and Swan are pretty close to each other and around a very similar distance from Earth, the problem is whether or not this cloud spans this whole part of the sky. So hopefully not. Let's see what happens. These streaks here you see are the stars that were moving while I was doing the exposure. So we'll start those over again. Here we go. Stars is a good sign, though. That means there might be sky here. Oh, look at that. Stars. Hooray. I'll wait to gather some more light from this nebula. So as the nebula is coming to view, I'll talk about it a little bit. So uh, Cat's Eye was 3,000 light years away from Earth. Uh, the Eagle Nebula is 7,000. So we're getting, we're getting pretty far away from our own planet. We're still within our own galaxy, though. And this... Uh, the nest, this nebula has one of the most active star forming regions in it uh, called the Pillars of Creation. It was actually one of the uh, targets of Hubble when Hubble like, like launched itself in, um, in the public eye. And this was one of the most famous photos that, that uh, Hubble took was of the pillars themselves. And we'll be able to see them as this image resolves. Uh, I'll point them out to you. My nebula is eluding me at the moment. Yeah, 
Now, this could be one of two reasons. One, there could be a little bit of haze still in the sky obscuring our nebula. Or two, I might be slightly off target. There are some pretty stars, though, that's true. One of the cool things about imaging through the telescope is that you can actually really clearly see the individual star colors. Uh, it's one of the things to think about. So when you're on Earth and you're looking up at the night sky, most stars that you see, actually all the stars that you see in the sky with your naked eye, are larger than our sun. All of them. Because they're bright white stars. That means they're bright enough for that light to reach you and excite the photoreceptors in your own eye. Whereas a lot of these fainter, redder stars, they are bright enough for the camera to see on the telescope, but you wouldn't be able to see them with your own eye. So space is a lot more colorful. Stars are a lot more colorful out there than our eyes give space credit for. All right, well, I'm not getting this nebula to appear here. So I'm wondering if maybe I might be in the wrong spot. All right, so what we're going to do, we'll come back to this one, and I'm going to go back to Swan and see if it's cleared up in that direction at all. Yeah, that's what I thought. Dr. Wu is confirming for me that it's probably a bit hazy out there. And so while the stars will come through the haze, faint light from the nebula is ultimately blocked. It acts like a filter. It's filtering out the things we want to see. We have jealous clouds in our own sky that are hiding space clouds. It's like, no, look at me. I can be a cloud. You don't even need expensive equipment to look at me. Okay, here we go. Maybe we'll get something out of this one. All right, sorry that over. All right, first exposure will at least let us know that there's some sky there. As we get some subsequent ones, hopefully those nebula will start to appear. So in when you're looking at images, so someone was asking about Hubble pictures and stuff earlier too. Something else to think about is that when we're doing live capture here on the live show, we are exposing the image enough so at least it becomes visible in the frame. But when you're looking at photos that come through from... Uh, if you have any friends that are doing like astrophotography, if you do astrophotography, you'll know what I'm talking about as well. Or even Hubble images. Those exposures are often hours or even days long uh, before you get enough detail out of it to make the image look as crisp as it does. Um, that is also why when you look at some of these objects through a telescope yourself, you're not even going to make out, say, some of the fuzziest details. Like to your eye, that'll kind of look like green smoke or haze. And that's because your eye isn't evolved to look at nebula. It's been evolved to like find fruit and hunt for animals and stuff. Um, so that's why the receptors in our eyes are just not sensitive enough to find these sorts of objects. All right, let's see what we got. I have a feeling here that we might be fighting some haze in the atmosphere. These ones are lower on the horizon too, and that's where I was seeing some of the, some of the clouds in the sky. Well, I'm still going to give you what is interesting about this, these two objects anyway. Um, so one of the things about them is that they are enormous. So when you are seeing images of nebula, they are huge. So whereas the ring nebula or the cat's eye nebula is only like a few light months across, uh, light hours maybe sometimes, uh, the Swan Nebula and the Eagle Nebula are 15 and uh, light years across and the Eagle Nebula is 70 light years across. And these are star forming regions, so there's stars that are being born in them. And they are sometimes hundreds or even thousands of stars that are being created in these clusters. So uh, the Swan Nebula, for example, has 800 solar masses worth of stuff, 800 of our suns worth of stuff available to be making stars. And some of those stars, even just a handful of them, are so big that they light up the entire nebula, which is why we're even able to see them at all. Um, the Eagle Nebula is 70 light years across. There's probably 8,000 stars being formed in that one nebula. Uh, one of the largest stars that's in the cluster inside that's lighting up the Eagle Nebula is 80 times the mass of our sun. So there's some giant stars being created in them. But although they're mainly new stars, some of them are so big and so massive that they may have already exploded. 
And there was some ongoing debate about the Eagle Nebula and the pillars of creation as to whether or not they still existed because um, there was thought that maybe a supernova had wiped them out, but it looks like now that they, they actually are still there. There wasn't a supernova, but the stars are so massive. The more massive the star, the shorter lived it is. So you can have stars being born and dying all within the same nebula just because of the short lifespan of some of these stars. Our sun has going to live for billions of years, but very massive stars, they'll burn themselves out even after a few million years. Okay, well, I think we're going we to give up on the nebula because I don't think we're going to be able to get anything from this one. I'm not seeing any of the nebulosity from this nebula. And the other two things I want to look at that are farther along our journey into space are going to be a lot brighter and easier to see. And that's because they are star clusters rather than diffuse gas nebula. So let's move on to the double cluster. And here we go. Okay, I should be able to use the same camera settings for these clusters, so I shouldn't have to switch that. Let's bring up my camera again. Clear this off, start over, and here we go. So the reason why I'd also pick these, not only is the cluster the next farther thing out, so the Eagle Nebula was around 7,000 light years, the double cluster is 7,500, but it is the next evolved form of the nebula. So when these nebulas are forming all these stars, where does the gas go? Well, eventually the stars, once they've formed, will start blowing all the gas away. And it'll leave these big clusters of stars that are then visible to us. Well, that doesn't look like a cluster of stars. Hmm. Might be looking clouds in this direction too. Let's see, I'll give it a chance here to do some more exposure. Hmm, no, well, not seeing these star clusters. This is why everyone, we build telescopes on very high mountains or put them into space. So we don't have this problem. Is it possible to look at Betelgeuse? So Betelgeuse is still below the horizon right now. Um, so it's not going to be up probably until much later this evening. Because Orion is more of a winter constellation. It's up more in the winter time. So in the summer, Orion doesn't start rising until very, very, very late. Yeah, I'm not even able to. Right now, the stacking software is not even really able to find stars for me to align to. So I don't think we're getting a lot here. Uh, Betelgeuse is neat though. Someone asked about Betelgeuse. So we were talking about lucky imaging earlier of Saturn and uh, Betelgeuse is the only other star that we've actually been able to take a picture of. Now what I mean by that is of course we can see stars. There's one here in this photo. But I mean in terms of actually being able to resolve it into a spherical ball. Because Betelgeuse is so large and it's close enough to us. It's the left shoulder in Orion that we were able to do that with the Hubble Space Telescope. We could actually resolve it into a ball. So the Sun and Betelgeuse are the only two stars that we've actually been able to take a picture of using that same process of lucky imaging. So yeah, it doesn't look like we're getting anything here. Okay, let's move on to another cluster. So these clusters, this cluster, if we were to be able to see it, uh, is a cluster of, we call it an open cluster. So these are stars that are new 
new young stars that have just been born. They're coming out of the nebula. They're blowing the nebula away, and then they start to float off into space. And usually, they are not necessarily gravitationally bound to each other. They might kind of orbit together in big clouds, but eventually they might find their way spread out into the rest of the galaxy. Whereas the clusters that we're going to look at now are definitely all clumped together, and they are the densest clusters of stars that we find in our galaxy, which is why they are called globular clusters. So called because they are, well, globs of stars. All right, here we go. Now, this one's higher in the sky as well, so hopefully we'll get a chance to see it. Now, again, pointing out where we're finding stuff in the sky, it's important where this, this globular cluster is. So earlier, we were looking here along the plane of the Milky Way. So this is kind of looking across, like from angles, from edge on, we're looking at the Milky Way galaxy, and we we're looking through the arms of the galaxy where these star-forming regions are. Well, globular clusters like M13 orbit above the plane of the galaxy they kind of like float around that central core of the galaxy itself and they are made of very very old stars and hopefully this time you can actually see something rather than me talking about it all right here we go let's see what happens survey says Hooray! Light! Amazing! So excited. Okay, so globular clusters are so cool. They, they are one of my favorite things to look at in space. So first of all, you have thousands and thousands and thousands of stars packed into a very tight space. So this is the Hercules cluster. It is now... We've now traveled about 23,000 light years away from Earth. So remember, this light has left us thousands and thousands of years ago. It is made of very old stars. So this is the opposite of what we would see in one of the open clusters, which we weren't able to see. But those are very young stars that have just been born in a cloud of dust and gas, these star-forming regions. Well, these stars are really, really, really old. These are ancient stars. You're looking at a relic from the early formation of our galaxy. Now, right now... We classify stars into three different populations. Let's see if I can bring this up a little bit more clearly first. There we go. And let's give this a wee bit of a tweak here. Stretch that out. Mm -hmm. There we go. You can punch in on this a little bit too. You can just see how many stars are in here. Oh, oh wrong way. Other way, Matthew. There we go. Yeah, look at that big dense ball of stars all floating around in there. So in a cluster like this, so we were talking about like in some of the star forming regions, you might have, say, 800 to 8,000 stars. And in the uh, double cluster, there's probably about 20,000 stars. In a cluster like this, in the Hercules, there could be 600,000 stars inside of it. But it's only 145 light years across. So think about that for one second. So we're inside of uh, like where we are in our own solar system. Between us and the closest star to us, which is called Proxima Centauri, is about 4.2 light years away is nothing. It's just one, there's one star, a whole bunch of random kind of stellar dust and material, and then another star. And in between here and there, there's nothing. In a cluster like this, over the course of four light years, you might have hundreds of stars. So that means if you were happen to be on a planet that was orbiting a star in one of these clusters, it might never be nighttime. There'd be so many stars so close to you in the sky that you actually wouldn't be able to see the rest of the universe. Isn't that astonishing? There's actually a short story uh, written about this called Nightfall by Isaac Asimov. And it's about a civilization that lives on a planet that orbits one of the stars in a cluster like this. And just randomly, there happens to be 
uh, an eclipse where a bunch of the moons cover all the closest stars to them in the sky, and suddenly they see for the first time that there's the rest of space. And I if think about that. That's it's astonishing. So much of our own science is based on being able to look up and see that there was a galaxy, there's a universe, that there's more to just our own planet. And so imagine if you wouldn't be able to have access to that, if we didn't know that there wasn't the rest of the universe, how that would impact our whole society, our philosophy, the way we think about science. It would be astonishing. So yeah, so these big balls of stars, they're really old. They orbit around the galactic core, um, and they're made of a po something called population two stars. So now we're, we're kind of getting into generations of stars a little bit. Um, right now, there's like three general broad categories or populations of stars. Uh, our sun is considered a population um, one star. And population mean, one means that it has a lot of extra minerals in it, or metals, we call it. Uh, in chemistry, um, metals are very specific to certain uh, uh, elements in the periodic table. But in astronomy, metals is everything that's just not hydrogen and helium. So in the early universe, there only was hydrogen and helium. And so each generation of star, as they're burning, are making more of these heavy elements, and then they explode. And when they do, they enrich the next population of stars with more of these metals. And those metals are also the raw material that make planets, and they make you and I. So we are literally made out of the older generations of stars. While stars in these clusters are so old, they tend to be one previous population of stars earlier than our own. So that means that they don't have a lot of metals, that means that even if there are planets in clusters like this, they're probably very tiny. Um, so there's probably not life in star clusters like this, at least not life that we know it. There's so much radiation, there's old stars, some of them might be dying. Um, and the fact is that these stars are packed so closely together with one another. Oh, I have enough here. I can probably actually get this brighter. Yeah, there we go. They're packed so closely with one another that um, the orbits of the planets are probably very unstable. They might get pulled apart. You might get kicked out of your orbit every once in a while. So... It would be a very hectic place. Uh, we've also discovered that some of these clusters probably have super um, or large black holes in the middle of them as well. Not super massive black holes. Those are black holes that you, you typically find at the center of galaxies like our own Milky Way. We have a black hole at the center of our galaxy. It's called Sagittarius A star, and it weighs four million times the mass of our sun. But within clusters like this, we have found black holes that are about 20,000 solar masses. We call them intermediate black holes. Um, so yeah, globular clusters are these relics from the ancient part times of our galaxy. And on top of that, we don't actually really know how they're made. We're not really sure. They could be made with um, from interactions between galaxies. We are pretty sure that our own Milky Way is a result of collisions with other galaxies that have merged together and that some of those collisions might end up creating these globs of stars. Kind of like when you make a smoothie and you don't blend it quite properly enough and there's big chunks left over. So this is kind of like a smoothie chunk of the Milky Way, essentially. That's one of the ways that we think that these are made. And they are all gravitationally connected to one another. So this blob of stars, unless it's distur distur disturbed in some way, uh, will just continue like this. Um, okay, let's go. There's actually one more of these clusters we can check out. Uh, so there's another one called M15. And I've never actually looked at this one through the telescope's camera. So I don't know how bright it'll be, but let's take a look. So remember, these things orbit around the outside of the galactic bulge, the center of the galaxy. So there's a bunch of these hail, uh, these, these globular clusters that orbit around. Um, we think within our own galaxy, there are probably about 150 to 160 of these globular clusters orbiting around our galaxy. And we actually use them as a way to determine how big uh, the central bulge of our galaxy actually is, which is pretty neat. Oh, there was a question here. It was hi how was hydrogen created? Oh, Joanna's got this one. So yeah, so hydrogen, yeah, hydrogen was primordial. So it was created in the Big Bang. But uh, basically after the Big Bang happened, we, we're pretty sure there was only hydrogen, helium, and trace amounts of lithium. All the rest of the heavier elements on the periodic table all came from stellar events. So from the deaths of stars, from stars burning uh, hydrogen, helium into heavier elements, and from star collisions. One of them in particular, uh, we think gold is created primarily by stars colliding, uh, specifically neutron stars. So if you have gold anywhere, like if you have gold jewelry or even the gold ele in the electronics that you have at home, the history of that gold is that it came from two stars colliding together. Isn't that neat? Everything, every the elements, there's stories being told in space where all these things came from. All right, here we go. M15. All right, we'll clear this one. Start our stack over again. 
I'll probably have to clear the next frame because often it, they start stacking before we're finished moving the telescope. Well, yeah, I can see it in there, so it definitely will stack. How does entropy work into that? Um, well, eventually what will happen is that, remember, stars are doing the work. So they are taking, um, they are, they are breaking, or they're fusing the hydrogen together. They're really taking the raw energy out of matter. Uh, but eventually they are, well, there's a couple of theoretical ends to the universe, but one of them is called the eventual heat death of the universe. And when that happens, uh, all the work that's possible will be done. And everything that is hot will eventually grow cold. And that'll, that'll be the end. Don't worry, that's not for like trillions of years though. So don't, you know, don't let anyone sell you insurance on that or anything. All right, I definitely saw a cluster in there somewhere. Oh, M15 is in Pegasus. That's the constellation that Messier 15 is in. Now, I definitely saw a star cluster in here when we first exposed it, but no, we might be fighting clouds in this direction. Which way are we looking right now? South. Dr. Wu, you said that you saw clouds south, so maybe we are looking into some clouds again. Yeah, there's not much here. That's too bad too because this this uh, this globular cluster M15 was the one. So this this is the next step up of distance. So M13 was um, 23,000 light years. M15 is 32,000. So this is even farther off. We're about toward the center of the galaxy at this point. It's about how far we are from the central core of our own galaxy. And this was the one that they had pretty good evidence that there was a, an intermediate mass size black hole in the center. So that whole cluster of stars is probably orbiting around that one black hole. I'm not seeing it. Okay, I think we're looking at clouds. Let's give it one more chance here, but I'm pretty sure that with the clusters are pretty bright, we'd see it almost right away. No. All right. That's fine. Oh, one other cool thing about M13, I wrote this note down. Um, so M13 is one of the places that we have actually sent messages to. So we haven't done a lot of uh, METI, we call it, messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. We've done a lot of SETI, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We use that usually do that by listening for signals from alien life, um, but we haven't heard any yet. But we've also done some signaling in M13, the Hercules cluster was one of the places that we actually sent a message to that had information about humanity and a little bit about us. We sent it in 1974, and that was from the Arecibo Telescope Array, which unfortunately a couple weeks ago suffered severe damage from a giant cable that fell right through the dish. Um, I haven't read up recently as to what the repair time on that is going to be like or if it can even be fixed. But um, yeah, from that Are from the Arecibo Telescope, uh, we sent a message to that cluster. Although now that we know more about globular clusters, it probably was one of the last places we should have messaged because there's probably not anything living there. <laughs> okay, I'm not seeing anything. All right, let's move on. Okay, so we're going to leave now the galaxy entirely. So we've gone to a distance of about 32,000 light years to get to the globular cluster. Now we are going to leave and we're going to look at a galaxy called Triangulum, which is known as Messier 33. Another one of those things that Charles Messier checked off as not being a comet. Now you can ask, why is there such a big jump? Why did we go from tens of thousands of light years to millions? Well, that's because between here and there, there's basically nothing. We have a space there it's called inter intergalactic space. And we think that most space between galaxies, there's probably still stars that float around. Uh, we've seen stars that get kicked out of our own galaxy. Sometimes a supermassive black hole can fling a star like entirely out of the galaxy itself, which is pretty amazing. Um, 
But there also might be a lot of hot gas that flows between galaxies. Uh, in fact, there's estimates that at least half of the material that's in the Milky Way, hot gas that's in the Milky Way, might have traveled from other galaxies. So then, if you extrapolate, you could say maybe half the material in your body might have actually traveled from another galaxy. It's pretty amazing. All right, galaxies are very faint, so we might have to wait a wee bit at least to get anything, but I am worried that we haven't even seen any stars, so we might still be looking into clouds. Is there that many clouds out there? I haven't taken a look outside for a while. Hmm, yeah, I'm not seeing anything. Do I find it worthwhile to do SETI? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, uh, one of the highlights of my entire life was I got to go to the SETI project last year and interview uh, Dr. Jill Tarter, who founded the SETI project and runs it. And I think it absolutely is worthwhile for two reasons. One is her own reason of why she does it. And she had said uh, the reason why she wants to do SETI is because if the, if the, you think about how big the galaxy is and how spread out life has to be then, if if two civilizations exist in the galaxy at the same time that they're actually able to send messages to each other, they exist coterminously, then that means that odds are that civilizations are pretty long-lived, that they, they lived through their technological infancy without destroying themselves, which is one of the things that we're worried about with our own civilization these days. So for her, it was hope that, you know, if we find another civilization, it means that survival is possible, that technological civilizations can live. And I think that's, yeah, that's a really important thing. And for us... Uh, my own reason why I think it's important to do is that it it's I think wonder and curiosity makes us more open to understanding more about life itself and looking at our world right now I think we need more of that kind of wonder and understanding with one another so in some ways SETI I think is like the ultimate quest for empathy you know trying to understand a life that might be completely different than you complete like different language way of perceiving time or the universe or anything um, I think my favorite SETI or like alien contact based movie besides contact itself, which is a great movie and you should all watch it if you haven't seen it yet already, um, is Arrival. I love that movie because it wasn't just about like them coming to share technology. It was about them coming to share. Uh, well, I don't want to give it away. Actually, just go see it. If you haven't seen it already, I'm not going to spoil it for you. Go see Arrival. Okay. We are looking at clouds. So there's nothing here to see. But some cool things about M33 that I was going to talk about, if you ever get a chance to see this galaxy or find a picture of it, cool uh, part from uh, like science fiction fandom fan theory stuff is that Messier 33 or the Triangulum Galaxy is the Star Wars galaxy. Uh, so people have suggested that this is the galaxy that's far, far away um, that Star Wars takes place in. And in fact, recent maps done... Uh, of the Star Wars galaxy have started to look more and more like Triangulum. So I think that even the Star Wars universe itself is starting to adopt that idea um, that, you know, that this is the this is the Star Wars galaxy. Uh, Triangulum is 60,000 light years across, so it's a lot smaller than our own galaxy. And it's probably got an order of about 40 billion stars. So only maybe a tenth of what we got. Um, Triangulum, though, is creating a lot of stars very quickly. So our galaxy... It uh, doesn't put out, I don't think, as many stars as this one does. Triangulum is creating about one star a year. Um, and I don't think our star creation rate is that high. So after a while, when a galaxy has used up enough of its raw material and gas, it just it, it slows down in its own star formation. Um, Andromeda creates about a fourth as many stars as Triangulum does. So Triangulum is creating a lot of stars very quickly, and it might be gravitationally bound to Andromeda. So uh, there's some theories that suggest that Triangulum is actually like kind of orbiting around or it's at least closely orbiting um andromeda and this this area of expertise is where dr wu has studied a lot of she's she your background is basically in galaxies so um is there anything more here we should be talking about even though we can't see this galaxy any what's one cool factoid of triangulum we should know about i'll let you think about that while we move on so i'm gonna move on to a m81 which is actually one of my other favorite galaxies to image i have a picture of this that i'm working on but I've been procrastinating and haven't gotten around to it yet. There we go. Uh, 
All right. So M81 is called Bode's Galaxy. And it is about 90,000 light years across. So again, a bit bigger. There are some, uh, it's actually, so one of the things that's interesting about galaxies is that it's, uh, um, we have, uh, it's, it's actually easier for us to see. Oh, actually, yeah, think about that. I forgot about that. So Dr. Wu pointed out that their M33, there's a picture of it actually right here on the desktop. So if I open this up, it's a quick picture of it that we did. So it kind of makes up for not having, you know, been able to see it. There we go, open with photos. <laughs> there it is, yay, okay. Uh, so here's a photo of Triangulum that we did through the observatory. This isn't a color stacked image, but here it is on the desktop. Uh, so you can see kind of the spiral shape of the galaxy here. All right. Uh, I see something in there. That's all right. But not seeing any stars is a bad sign. I see one fuzzy star, but this also might be, might be a cloud in there. Yeah, it is amazing that we can take images of things that are so distant to us. It's, it is quite incredible. And again, it's, it's, this is the advent of technology that, I mean, think about how uh, ancient astronomers, they made so many observations with stuff that was so primitive like any telescope, any backyard telescope that you could go buy today for even like less than a hundred bucks is probably more advanced than some of the most incredible discoveries that we made about our own universe hundreds of years ago. All right, let's see. Mm. Yeah, it looks like it's in there somewhere. Let's see. I can do a little bit more of a stretch. A lot of blue in this, which suggests light pollution or clouds. But let's see, let's drop the blue down a wee bit. Yeah, that's pretty fuzzy. I'm not even picking up enough stars to get the stack to go. So we might be in some haze over here as well. Well, someone had asked about Andromeda, so maybe we can do that as a backup. Maybe we can check out Andromeda before we I want to get at least one galaxy in here. Moving on. All right, moving on to Andromeda. Andromeda has a huge part in our own history. Um, for up until 19, I'm going to say 1926, we were observing Andromeda. It used to be called the Andromeda Nebula. And we thought that it was actually part of our own galaxy. We didn't realize that it was extragalactic. In fact, we didn't know that extragalactic was even a thing. We didn't know that other galaxies even existed. Imagine that, up until 1926, we had no idea that there were even other galaxies outside of our own Milky Way. And a guy named Edwin Hubble, so named after the, or the Hubble Space Telescope is named after him, of course. Uh, he was looking at some stars, we call them Cepheid variable stars. And Cepheid variable stars will change in their brightness over a period of time, and when they do, they are they allow us to measure distances across space and he was looking at some of the distances to these um uh, to these stars and had suggested like well wait a second 
uh, he got a measurement of about 900,000 light years. And we knew that our galaxy was not that big. So Andromeda had to be something that was outside of our own galaxy. Now, we have refined that measurement now to about 2.4 million light years. So it's even farther, but it was far enough away for Hubble to be able to tell that Andromeda was in fact another galaxy. And that was the first time that we knew that the universe had more than one galaxy. At that time, we used to call galaxies island universes because we used to think of the Milky Way as its own universe. And now the, the Andromeda was another universe. And since then, we have captured or seen evidence of probably up to 2 trillion other galaxies that make up even just the observable universe that we can see. Um, so think about that. So until 1926, we, we only knew of the Milky Way. And then after that point, we knew of the Milky Way and Andromeda. And since then, we've, we've cataloged and mapped millions of other galaxies from which we can infer that there probably are trillions of galaxies that make up the universe. All right, let's see what we got here. This is also looking a wee fuzzy. And Godwin's asking about the Fermi paradox. So that's uh, kind of an apocryphal question, but it was asked by Enrico Fermi, who's a nuclear physicist, who the story goes that one day over lunch, he asked, where is everybody? And the question was, well, if there's life out there and the universe is so big and so old, then how come we haven't seen any of that life yet? And then kind of the ensuing discussion as to what that might mean. And there's not one clear answer to that yet. It's all just kind of speculation. One of them is called the galaxy or the uh, uh, alien zoo theory which is that there are aliens and they're observing us, but they've just decided not to contact us yet for whatever reason. We're not advanced enough or they don't want to interfere with our society. For Star Trek fans out there, the uh, Federation of Planets is guided by something called the Prime Directive. And it says that you can't interfere with another society before they've achieved faster than light space travel. And we have not done that yet. So maybe until that happens, maybe we're actually part or, or inside the borders of some Federation we don't even know about. Well... Dr. Wu, what are you thinking? I'm thinking I'm still looking through clouds because this doesn't seem to be resolving very clearly. I feel like I should have more data here. Well, I can see, it looks like the core of the galaxy is here. So that's the bright center of Andromeda. So the spiral arms are probably heading out in this direction, but I am not seeing them. And my stack is not stacking. So I don't, yeah, it's not a good sign. So probably not. So what happens in order for the computer to be able to stack the images, it aligns based on where it sees stars. So stars are what's necessary for the software to be able to align the frames. And if it's not able to see enough stars because of any uh, anything blocking the sky, then of course we can't actually make the frame. But that's okay, because we're getting near the end of our time. And I was hoping, the whole point of this was that we would return. So we've gone out into the far stretches of the universe, but we would return back home by talking about the one place that we actually can physically visit and that we're doing so next in the, in the, in the next couple months, and that is Mars. And I've, if I've done my calculations correct, I think Mars is high enough to be able to see by now. Let's find out. Mars. Is it high enough in altitude to see? I don't think so. Maybe not yet. Ah, it's only at four degrees, so it probably won't be high enough for us to see. I was really hoping that Mars would be high enough by now for us to get to, um, but it doesn't look like we'll be able to. But that's okay, because I'm going to show you a couple of pictures I've got set up here. Um, so one, when we were looking at uh, formation of stars earlier in the uh, stellar nurseries, I had a picture I wanted to queue up here, and this was of, um, we call them proplids. So these are actually taken within the Orion Nebula, and by the Hubble Space Telescope, and these are forming solar systems. These are baby solar systems that are forming inside of the gas clouds. So in some of the nebula, if we had been able to see them, I want to be able to show um, 
that uh, this is where inside of the clouds is what these stars actually look like. And so these are ancient or early uh, young forming solar systems. So if you go back in time about, well, a couple billion years, this is what our, old, our own solar system would have looked like. These are baby solar systems that are forming. And we've been able to take images of the disks, we call them protoplanetary disks, that are forming around these stars. Now, this early into the formation of a solar system, there likely aren't that many rocky planets, probably just gas giants. As Gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn were probably the first to form in our own solar system. But for the first time, we've taken a one really, really, really high resolution image of a protoplanetary disk, and this is what it looks like. Um, this disk is around a star that's about uh, 450 light years away. It was taken by the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, so this is actually not invisible light, it's in uh, radio waves. Um, but this is what an image of a forming solar system looks like. So here's the star in the middle. This is the disk of raw material that eventually become planets, uh, both gas planets and terrestrial planets around the star. And probably some of these paths that are clear around the star is where some of the planets have begun to form. So they are going around and picking up all this material and adding it or accreting it to themselves to form themselves into planets. So one of the definitions of being a planet is that you have to have cleared out a path around your star. So likely this is probably the path of a really large gas giant that's orbiting around this one star. It's cleared out this path around it, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so, yeah. And lastly, we were talking about Mars. Um, so I wanted to show you, this is a picture of the Perseverance rover. And so this is the rover that we just recently sent to Mars last July. And it's going to be arriving in February, February the 18th. It's going to land on the ground. And it's one of the first missions that's actually going to be pre uh, preparing soil from Mars to be packed up and returned back to our own planet. Uh, so we've never done that before, but this is part of the Perseverance's mission. It will also be looking at a region of Mars that was known to be flooded in the past and have clay... Uh, flat, so actually looking at clay soil samples in the ground on Mars uh, for ancient signs of life. So Perseverance isn't looking for current life on Mars, uh, but it will be looking for signs of past life on Mars. And then in 2022, the European Space Agency is sending another rover called the Rosalind Franklin, and it is going to be looking for current life on Mars. And the only way to do that is to dig down deep, probably at least two meters beneath the surface of the planet. And so uh, these two vehicles, one is looking at past life, the next one's looking at present life, and they are going to be looking for uh, to, to answer to that question as to whether or not there's life elsewhere in the universe. And I, I'm doing a, a, a shameless self-promotion here, but this is an article written on Universe Today. Uh, they are one of Canada's big science uh, magazines. And I wrote this one, so if you want to check out a little bit about the history of Mars exploration and the future of these missions, you can go to Universe Today, look me up, Matt Simone, and you'll find this article and you can check it out. Well, I think that wraps things up for us. Thanks so much for joining us uh, tonight at the SFU Trache Observatory. I'm sorry that there were some clouds that had obscured our view. Um, just one of those things that happens. But uh, next time we've got uh, an opening in the sky or when it looks like the weather's good, we'll definitely let you all know so that we can go and explore the sky together again with one another. We really appreciate all of you that come in and do these with us. Um, we're obviously missing the observatory and being able to go and and uh, and hang out together in person. Uh, but this is certainly the next best thing. And we really appreciate seeing you here, uh, especially some of the familiar faces that have been coming out from week to week. And so if you're enjoying these and, uh, you know, you get stoked on space and on touring the night sky, then please go and tell people about us when we're putting our links out, share them. Um, you know, we want to share this with as many people as we can. Our job is to make space as close as possible for all of us. So you can help us do that job, too. So we're going to sign off here. Uh, remember to keep looking up and we'll see you next time on uh, the Trache Observatory stream for Starry Nights.